Welcome to Extraterrestrial Reality. Was there an extraterrestrial killed on the runway of McGuire Air Force Base back in 1978? That's a big question. A lot of people in, who study UFOs have been wondering this for many, many years now. Um, there, as the story goes back on January 18th, 1978, uh, apparently there was an extraterrestrial spotted running uh, or uh, on, on a runway at this McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey and, and was shot dead. Um, now, one of my uh, YouTube subscribers, Kevin Gould, he he has a he, he contacted me recently and he, he alerted me to his he has a blog where he talks about UFOs and he actually put together an authoritative article on this whole uh, McGuire Air Force Base incident, this alleged incident from 1978. He's done a lot of research on this uh, and. Uh, I'm gonna. I'll leave. Of course, I'll leave the link to this. You gotta check it out. It's. You gotta check out his blog. There's. There's other things on there too. You might want to check out for sure. But uh, he really did a uh, did some research on this uh, McGuire Air Force Base incident that allegedly happened in 1978. And he ha and, I, and in the story, if you go if you go to his blog, there's also a lot of different links and from uh, uh, that you could click on too. That w f from the different places where he where he. Uh, accumulated some of the information uh, to write this piece that he did and we're going to go through uh, uh, some of this article and talk about it and uh, I think it's a really interesting story and it uh, there's a lot of question marks with it however uh, but anyway uh, Kevin talks about you know he actually when he was a kid he he grew up on a he starts off his article he grew up on a, a rural road in Wrightsville New Jersey directly directly across uh, one of the runways at McGuire Air Force Base uh, and he could see things sometimes. And actually, he says that uh, he, he could see the planes, you know, landing, taking off. Uh, he saw. He said one time he saw a strange gray triangular shaped aircraft soaring above uh, during an air show. And he still don't know what it was. Uh, it was some sort of craft that he was never able to identify. Uh, but he didn't know at that, you know, when he was a little kid at the time that just 10 years before that this incident, this alleged incident had unfolded where uh, an extraterrestrial was shot dead on a runway at McGuire. Anyway, I'm going to go through some of this article and we'll talk about it as we go through it. And again, thank you, Kevin, I want to say for uh, alerting me to this. Uh, I really appreciate it. <clears throat> this is really good stuff. As the story goes, in the early morning hours of January 18th, 1978, multiple UFOs were spotted over McGuire Air Force Base and Fort Dix, with the Fort Dix military police and New Jersey State Police responding. Air Force pilots approaching McGuire had observed the discs over the base and radioed the control tower operators who could see the UFOs out their windows as they tracked them on radar. One Fort Dix MP, John Samuels, gave chase to an object that hovered low over his patrol vehicle. He described the UFO as featureless and oval-shaped, emitting a blue-green glow. Samuels' radio suddenly died as he drove along a dirt road in a heavily wooded section of the Fort Dix training area. The area adjoined a disused runway on the back of the McGuire airfield, not far from Gate 5 on Brody Road and its intersection with Texas Avenue. Suddenly, a strange being appeared in front of Samuel's patrol vehicle. It was about four feet tall and gray-brown in color, with a fat head, long arms, and a slender body. It appeared to be nude, and its skin looked hairless, wet, shiny, and snake-like. Panicked, the officer fired five rounds from his forty-five caliber pistol into the creature. He also shot a round into the UFO, which fled straight upward and joined with 11 others like it, like it high in the sky. Multiple witnesses at the joint base saw the UFOs, which had initially flown in tight formations before dispersing in different directions. Wow, that's amazing stuff. Can you imagine? Imagine seeing that. It's not usual we hear stories where there's a, a, an alien unprotected and... <clears throat> Uh, that that could be uh, susceptible to gunfire. A lot of you, you, the, these things just don't usually happen. But in this case, if if it's true, if this story is true, we we just don't know. If it is true, then <laughs> somehow this alien ended up on the runway. There was UFOs flying around. What were they doing? What what, what was happening? Why were they there? Uh, why was there an alien on the ground with no clothes on yet? But then again, we uh, sometimes these things do happen. They they are reported sometimes to not be wearing anything. Uh, 
Anyway, continuing. The mortally injured being fled into the woods and scaled the fence separating the bases. Several patrols had rushed to the scene by this point and found that the being had expired near the old runway and a defunct New Jersey Air National Guard hangar at McGuire Air Force Base. The ba dead being was said to have given off a bad stench like ammonia. MPs roped off the area and the Air Force Office of Special Investigations took over. High-level Blue Berets quickly imposed a curtain of secrecy with at least a dozen guards armed with M16 surrounding their ropes and barring anyone but top brass and a base photographer from approaching. Later that day, a team from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, no, of course, Wright-Patterson, long rumored to be a depository for top secret UFO evidence, arrived in a C-141. Personnel laid the, stra uh, laid the strange body in a wooden box and utilized a portable tank to spray it with a clear liquid. They placed the box into a large, larger metal container, loaded it onto the airplane, and lifted off for the return trip to Wright-Patterson. Of course, as we all know, everything seems, uh, uh, in a lot of cases, anything that's alien-related gets shipped off to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Uh, I wonder if there's anything still there right now. <clears throat> I'd love to know. Anyway, continuing, it says here, The main source of this story is Sergeant Jeffrey Morse, a suit, which is a pseudonym, who claimed to be an Air Force security policeman, a Blue, Blue Beret regular, on McGuire at the time of the incident. Morse witnessed the UFOs and arrived in time to see the mysterious corpse from a distance of about 50 feet. While Morse didn't get a clear look at the being's face, hands, or feet, he produced a simple sketch that he said was, My impression of something not human. Morse said that all the personnel were threatened with court-martial if they said anything about the encounter. Two days later, Morse and two other witnesses were flown to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where they were interrogated by military and civilian officials, signed forms swearing them to secrecy, and were quickly transferred to separate bases overseas. Morse to Okinawa, Japan... And, and Morse was sent to Okinawa, Japan. Morse would later claim that his decision to come forward with this story resulted in government surveillance and intimidation, including interference with his ability to obtain government jobs after the, the conclusion of his military service. Now, I want to stop here for a second. Now, what's interesting about a lot of these cases where you hear these stories like this. Now, this, uh, now Morse, of course, it's a pseudonym. Now, he says that, you know, he tells his story and that, uh, now he didn't see the being's face. He was standing from a distance of about fifty feet away. He he he's he's given in a story that sounds plausible to me because you know like a lot of times you know you could hear these incredible stories when people are telling fabricated stories they're going to embellish things and then a lot of times like if people are liars they'll they'll tell you like. Uh, these ridiculous, insane stories that you, you could you just feel like they're lying. Like I don't think this guy. To me, this guy's story always sounded credible. Morse's story to me sounds credible because it's not like he. I mean, he. he I mean, he could. He could have just. I mean, if, if it was if he was making this whole thing up, right? He could have said, "Well, yeah, I saw the, the alien look like this," and even though he didn't see it, he's telling to to me this this rings true because he's telling you uh, he didn't see everything. It looked like an alien, but he never saw the face. I mean, he could have just said, "Yeah, I saw the face." It looked like a gray alien if he was making it up, but he didn't. So that's what gives this to me gives a story like this plausibility because. Uh, you know, it, it, you could have, if, 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 if it's just a yarn, the, the, it could have been a lot more fanciful, but it's not, it's not. Uh, and anyway, he has a picture here and, uh, uh, drawing the sketch, uh, Jeffrey Morse drew of what he saw. Uh, anyway, continuing here with this article, it says here, Morse's account is supported by retired U.S. Air Force Major George A. Filer, who later became the Eastern Director of the Mutual UFO Network and a member of the Disclosure Project. Filer was stationed at McGuire Air Force Base as an intelligence officer in 1978, but was not present at the time of the incident. When Filer arrived at work the next morning, he noted unusual emergency activity on the base. Filer was informed of the shooting and tasked with preparing a report to brief Major Thomas Sadler, commander of the base's 21st Air Force Military Airlift Command. Filer interviewed the Air Force personnel who participated in the incident, but not the Army side, including the MP who shot the alien. Filer claimed that photographs were taken of the body, but he was prevented from viewing them 
at the last second. When Filer had completed his report and arrived to brief Sadler, the commander of the 438th Security Police Squadron, Morse's supervisor, was speaking with the Major General. On the way out the door, the police squadron commander told Filer he had already... He had already briefed the general and Filer need not bother. Sadler just still waved Filer in and the intelligence officer presented the read-only report. In case of listening devices, the commander read the report in silence and the two men did not discuss it. Wow, they're really... I'm going to stop there. That's really interesting, isn't it? They, they won't even read things out. Like when it comes to the alien stuff, right? If they have a report when they're, that, that, that re, re, uh, in, with regard to one of these incidents, they don't even read it out loud in front of each other just in case there's listening devices. That's how deep That's how deep they got to keep this secret. They, gotta, they, they, they just can't let the public know no matter what. They can't even let each other know. Because it's all, again, it's all compartmentalized. Like, you know, the people that are, like this uh, filer, of course, obviously, he's, he wasn't given all the, all I mean, he, he was on the uh, on the periphery. He, he, he's on the outskirts of this cover-up. Like, he's, he knows something's going on, but he doesn't, he, he's, he's not uh, briefed on it. He's not given it mo- much information. And so, that, that's, why, that's why, at some point, you know, he provides the information uh, publicly because he doesn't like the idea uh, of this secrecy. Anyway, continuing here. Uh, Filer would claim separately that he was told not to give the briefing because it was too hot. Morse first came forward to UFO researcher and writer Leonard Stringfield in 1980 to share his account of the fatal alien encounter at Fort Dix McGuire. Stringfield and his colleague, former assistant director of NICAP, Richard Hall, interviewed Morse over the next few days. They found Morse credible and consistent in his story. Let me just stop there. Yeah, for one thing, Stringfield, this guy was a serious investigator, Leonard Stringfield. Uh, and if he found somebody credible, you could. Uh, you, this guy was probably credible. Uh, they found Morse credible and consistent in his story. Hall was able to authenticate all but one of the officers that Morse said interrogated him at Wright Patterson, including a brigadier general. Although information about their assignments at the time of the supposed interrogation was unavailable, Morse also produced what he said was the incident slash complaint report that McGuire secret that. McGuire security police had prepared about the shooting. It was directed toward Colonel Landing, commanding officer of McGuire Air Force Base, Brigadier General uh, Brown, Headquarters 21st Air Force Base at McGuire Air Force Base, and the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, AFOSI, according to Stringfield. The report listed Morse and the other security policemen involved, as well as the Fort Dix MP who shot the strange being. Stringfield omitted those names from the copy of the incident report he revealed in his 1985 paper on the matter. Morse had already blocked out the social security numbers listed ne- next to each individual to protect their privacy without that information hall could not confirm the identities and assignments of the of the enlisted men uh and then he goes on here the mcguire fort dix alien was among the cases investigated by the national institute for discovery science nids founded by millionaire and real estate developer and aerospace entrepreneur robert bigelow from 1995 to 2004 nids studied ufos and other anomalous phenomena most famously owning and conducting research on Skinwalker Ranch in Utah. The group dug into the McGuire uh, Fort Dix case in 2000. NIDS investigators confirmed that Morse, whose true identity was in their files, worked as an airman E-4 at McGuire Air Force Base, but were unable to locate him in order to conduct their own interview. They also could not find Samuels, the MP said to have shot the alien. NIDS did, however, contact several Air Force officials who were assigned to McGuire Air Force Base at the time of the incident on January 18th, 1978. Uh, Colonel Kenneth Landon, base commander, who was noted in the incident report, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Mazurkowitz, commander of the 438th Security Police Squadron, who, squadron, who was listed in the incident report as having investigated the shooting, the Air Force Office uh, of Special Investigations Detachment Commander, and Major Thomas Sadler, the 21st Air Force Commander. The four main people on the base in 1978 who should have known of a UFO sighting were interviewed. None of them claimed to know anything about the alleged sighting or alien close encounter, reported NIDS investigator Robert uh roger pinson now of course uh why would they state publicly uh that they know anything about it i mean if you're basically sworn to you're you're sworn to secrecy you're told you can't talk about this ever i mean why would then if you get interviewed you're not going to say anything right a lot of the in a lot of cases i'm i'm sure a lot of these people you know if, if you're in the military 
like obviously there were people in roswell that were part of this whole roswell incident military people that were told within the military that were told to keep quiet and it's also seems that some of them were actually paid at that time in 1947 to keep quiet they were given money uh <clears throat> continuing here it says in addition mazurkowitz said he would not have been listed as an investigator in the incident report. Rather, he was a superior to whom an investigator would have reported. The 438th commander identified several discrepancies in the way the report was filed out. He explained that if Morse was a security police officer, he would have had access to blank forms but wouldn't necessarily have the right technique in completing them unless he had been a desk sergeant or performed administrative duties. The former squad commander opined that the incident report was probably a forgery. So they're saying that this incident report that was originally presented by this uh, Morse, the pseudonym, uh, could have been forged and made up. Uh, continuing here, it says, Finally, NIDS contacted, contacted Colonel B, a retired judge advocate general uh, colonel, who Morse claimed had interrogated and debriefed him at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, playing the bad cop in a good cop, bad cop scenario. The officer claimed he had been a... Uh, J, uh, J, a a uh, jag at mcguire air force base at the time uh, judge advocate general at the time of the ufo incident but had never heard of the situation had never been to wright patterson and had no knowledge of, of of a morse being interrogated none of the men recalled working with filer <clears throat> Based on finding zero corroboration of the 1978 McGuire Air Force Base incident during his preliminary, preliminary investigation, NIDS hypothesized that the case was a hoax and marked it still pending. NIDS did address the possibility that it was being deceived by the senior military officials who could have been protecting their oath of secrecy and denying all knowledge. That's where I want to stop there for a second. Yes. I think that the senior military, there's always that good, there's always a good chance that the senior military officials uh, who say that nothing, that nothing happened, there was nothing, nothing that we know of, we didn't hear anything about that. Uh, a lot of times, like I, I, don't, I don't trust any of these people. When, 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 when you have people who are in the lower rungs of the ladder telling you about an incident that happened, and they seem like they're extremely sincere, and and they offer so, like even so, uh, uh, you know might not it might be minuscule, but it's at least some sort of evidence, right? Uh, and there's and there are there is some corroboration. You have there was actually another guy there to help that help corroborate it. Well, then uh, I have trouble believing the people at the top because for one thing, I know that there are extraterrestrials here, right? And 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 I know that the government's been lying about them. So how could you believe any when 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 in this case, as far as I'm concerned, I would I would believe Morse and and uh, and Filer before I believe these other uh, senior intelligence officials. <laughs> Uh, okay, but uh, cont continuing here, it says, but Nids remarked that Pinson had extensive training in interviewing and interrogation techniques, as well as the detection of deception. Pinson had cold called the subjects, and they re replied to his questions without hesitation, leading Nids to believe they were being truthful. Okay, let's let's just stop there for a second. <clears throat> Yeah, these there's there's people out there. I mean, there's some people that have run YouTube channels, and they're 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 very entertaining. People that could uh, listen to somebody and, and tell whether they're lying or not. Uh, and so they 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 this guy this Pinson uh, said felt that well these senior intelligence guys uh, these senior military officials rather uh, they seem like they're telling the truth. Okay, but that doesn't mean that they are. You know, that doesn't mean that the one guy is right. Uh, you know, one one investigator is right just because he believes he feels that. Anyway, continuing. So that's where the professional investigation left the case of the alien shot dead at McGuire Air Force Base. The NIDS report seems damning, but there is one eerie detail that continues to gnaw at my skin from the inside. The pungent ammonia-like scent that Morse claimed to have emanated from the dead alien across the chilly night air. Uh, now we're gonna. Uh, now, of course, there's we we've heard about this kind of stuff before. This kind of uh, uh, when, when there's an odor uh, around aliens, uh, some some of them seem to have an ammonia odor uh, odor to them, like in the Virginia case. And uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more when we come back. We're gonna take a quick break. Okay, we are back. Uh, continuing with this story about the air, uh, alien shot dead allegedly at uh, McGuire Air Force Base in 1978, uh, and uh, they're, they're ta we're talking about this this stench that this uh, that some people were uh, that uh, the witness uh, talked about. There was a a, 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 a strong, a, a rotten, pungent stench, 
And uh, Leonard Sting Stringfield, the late inve UFO investigator, wrote that a vomit-inducing stench, like a combination of battery acid and ammonia, also prevailed at the alleged crash site uh, of a flying saucer in 1954, in which dead extraterrestrials were scattered about the New Mexico desert. Now we're talking again. Uh, the the there was a, this alien that was shot at the at the Air Force Base allegedly stunk like this too, and then there was other cases like this where where, where uh, again and he, we're gonna get into it right here. There was a the case in 1954, and of course uh, in James Fox's 22 documentary Moment of Contact, multiple witnesses described the horrible ammonia like or odor or alternately a smell described as worse than sulfur. When they encountered living and dead alien beings following an alleged UFO crash in Virginia, Brazil in 1996. The dreadful scent remained in one woman's nasal passages for weeks, no matter how she tried to flush it out. Way back in 1933, a man in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, discovered a bell-shaped UFO landed alongside a desolate road between Cherryville and Moorestown. He poked his head into the craft and found a small control chamber only about four feet high and that was unoccupied and smelled of ammonia it's a small but vivid detail that pops up in a number of alleged, alleged encounters with alien beings and it is pretty specific do smelly aliens particularly with that of ammonia fragrance fragrance lend more authenticity to such accounts yeah, let's just stop there i think yeah i think it does i mean in some cases there seems like some of these aliens smell like ammonia now those uh virginia beings they didn't look like you they weren't described as your normal kind of gray aliens you don't usually hear that with those things but uh like maybe in that 1954 incident perhaps but uh for the most part uh maybe <laughs> i don't know maybe maybe they need that kind of uh, an atmosphere of um, uh, with ammonia in it to survive and I, how that being got if it is true if the story is true you wonder what happened in virginia virginia and what happened in uh mcguire mcguire air force base in 1978 that you know what if, if these beings need to survive in some sort of uh environment so surrounded with with that of, of ammonia or, or or some other substance that stinks right then what what are they doing outside the craft how did that happen how did they what why would they get out of a craft and be running around on a runway in the first place uh, anyway, continuing here, <clears throat> molecular astrophysicist Cl Clara Sousa Silva penned the 2019 Scientific American Opinion co column titled, When We Finally Find Aliens, They Might Smell Terrible. In the column, Salsa Silva postulated that life on planets less dominated by oxygen might thrive on other gases. Salsa Silva pinpointed phosphine, a foul, fishy, and toxic to us gas, as a determiner for locating life on exoplanets since it can only be produced by biological entities. But that would mean that extraterrestrials who produce phosphine, or perhaps ammonia, might be naturally repulsive to us and vice versa. According to a Massachusetts Institute of, Psycho of Technology MIT study published in 2022, ammonia is a biosignature gas that space telescopes space telescopes could search for when examining exoplanet atmospheres for life using transit spectroscopy determining the chemical composition of a planet's atmosphere via starlight passing through it ammonia plays a large role in biochemistry and is highly soluble in water it, its presence in a planet's atmosphere could indicate that biological life is producing ammonia in, in substantial amounts the MIT scientists proposed a planetary scenario called a cold Haber world in which life evolved within a hydrogen-nitrogen atmosphere. These beings could have developed catalytic machinery that can break down the triple chemical bond of molecular nitrogen and extract energy by fixing or converting atmospheric hydrogen and nitrogen into ammonia. This scenario is named after the Haber process, the main industrial procedure for the production of ammonia. In short, if there is any truth to the multiple accounts of extraterrestrial visitors reeking of ammonia, perhaps they originate on a planet such as MIT described. And then Kevin... Uh, uh, ends the article this way he said it doesn't matter th that much to me whether the mcguire fort dix alien is an unearthly encounter buried in secrecy or a tangled morass of modern folklore just like the jersey devil it's a tale i connect with deeply it resides along the murky underbelly of intrigue in my home state a hidden dimension of horror and wonder just behind the veil of familiar streets this is very well written kevin i really appreciate you sharing this uh, and and again, yeah. If you if, if, for everyone out there that are listening to this, uh, 
you know, check out the link for this. And again, there's a lot of sources that he lists here. This is a very uh, detailed and authoritative. It's probably, I, 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 this is probably the best article that's been put together on this, uh, you know, perhaps. Uh, I, I know I've read it before, but this is probably the most detailed. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, very interesting stuff. But I guess the, the bottom line is, is, is it true or false? Now, uh, if you're going to go by the nightcap guy, uh, the nightcap guy said that he believes that the senior uh, military officials that he interviewed that said there's nothing to this story that they were telling the truth. Again, I don't, I, I don't, I say I have a problem with senior military officials, especially when they come talk when they start talking about UFOs and aliens because I don't believe a word that because some of them are definitely lying. Let's put it that way. Some, uh, you know, and then you have other people that talk about it. Like the, the guy that's telling that incident, oh, well, I mean, if, if the whole thing was a lie and it was all made up, then uh, why, you know, you know, I guess if you could say this, you could say, well, he didn't, he didn't embellish, he didn't uh, make the story too fanciful because then that would make it seem like it was phony. So then he, he pulls back and he, and he, oh, he says, well, okay, well, I didn't see the alien's face then. So then, yeah. But then you had the other guy too, Filer, that, uh, from, that was, part of this and and he was attesting to this so i i don't know uh i mean why would filer lie about this now that, that guy was you know that wasn't a pseudonym he was using his real name and he became a, a director for mufon and the eastern director of mufon so uh you know i i i would probably lend more to the fact to the idea that this that this really happened because you know what i think it does happen sometimes i think mean, aliens do get out of their ships for whatever reason and we do know that they poke around military bases all the time and who knows what what what, what it was doing running around on the runway why would one of these beings be doing that now the only issue is is like you would think like in a lot of cases with aliens it seems like when when when, when there are humanoid sightings i mean this is we're not talking about abduction scenarios uh, but I mean, it's been in incidents where people come upon aliens, right? Usually the aliens are, are ready for you, no matter what. Like in a lot of cases, they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll freeze you in, 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 uh, in place. Like I know I've done a podcast on how extraterrestrials use freeze rays. I mean, uh, we've been hearing about this since at least the 1950s. In, in uh, 1954, during the, the so-called uh, Great French U uh, UFO uh, flying saucer invasion, there, were, there was a lot of incidents where people would see humanoids. In fact, the, one of the most famous ones was uh, one with uh, Marius de Wilde. And I'm going to just touch on that one for, for a second here. Uh, this is the incident. This is from a different site. I will leave the link for this uh, article, too. This is from UF oac.com and it's about the marius de wild incident the, the house of the frenchman marius de, de wild was very close to the railway line that led to the nearby nearby mine the proximity that like, this guy lived near a railway line he said the proximity to the railway would not have been particularly troublesome if it hadn't been for the local peasants who were in the habit of stealing gravel from the embankment to sprinkle it on the roads in their settlements which became muddy during the rains because of their theft Marius was often annoyed by the police and the restoration work near his house frightened the cattle. De Wilde was especially afraid of a possible wreck because of this theft because the derail, derail train could well destroy his small cozy house. So when late in the evening of September 10th, 1954, he went out into the garden and saw a dark mass on the tracks, De Wilde decided that this was another carload of thieves and was going to have a cool talk with them. Suddenly his dog barked furiously and crawled up to his master in a strange way. At the same moment, footsteps were heard on the path nearby. Marius lit a lantern and revealed two rather strange creatures about a meter tall wearing coveralls with helmets on their heads who were clearly moving in the direction of a dark object standing on the tracks either marius didn't know who he was dealing with at first or he thought the creatures were playing with children but he rushed to the gate to catch them the first runt was just a couple of meters away when a bright beam of light suddenly burst out of the object on the tracks which completely paralyzed the determined earthman when the lights went out and Marius was able to move again, the object on the tracks managed to get off the ground. A, thi a thick jet of black smoke escaped from it and it flew away. De Wilde, in his fright, ran two kilometers to the nearest police station to report what had happened, but the gendarmes, gendarmes took him for a madman and only laughed at him. The neighbors found out about the story, and Marius had a chance to experience their ridicule. And there's a lot of stories like this. So a lot of times, like, it seems like when, when somebody just comes upon a, a humanoid in a lot of cases throughout the decades, they'll, 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 they'll uh, 
freeze you and, and, and you can't move. That's what happens. They have the ability to do that. So you wonder, like, why why wasn't this alien that was running around on the runway at McGuire not equipped to uh, prevent anyone from shooting him? You know, why didn't he? Why didn't that? That why wasn't he equipped with a freeze ray like these other beings seem to be equipped with? Uh, instead, this alien, if if this if the McGuire Air Force Base story is true, then that alien basically got caught with its pants down and was shot dead on the on a runway, and then the whole thing was covered up and. And we just all moved on with life. But like you say, it wasn't covered up. Like say like th- that really did happen. And the next day, we there was big stories in the newspapers, newspaper. That would have been fantastic. Wouldn't it be great if we all just were being told the truth the whole time over all these years? You know, alien being shot dead at McGuire. You know, Roswell, we, we, we uh, UFO flying disc captured at Roswell. Alien beings found inside. Wouldn't it have been better right from the beginning just to tell the truth about this stuff? Of course, we don't know about McGuire Air Force Base. We're not even, you know, and, and you know, some of these stories that uh, are out there, I would say a small percentage of them are definitely phony. There's definitely a percentage that are phony. But a lot of them are definitely real. I know this because I've seen one of the beings. I know that there's, be, there's extraterrestrials here, and I saw one of the craft. I, so I, I know that there's something going on. And I know that the government's lying. I've done enough research to know that. But it wouldn't it be better if they were just telling the truth about this the whole time wouldn't that have been a great headline? If, say, this uh, McGuire Air Force Base deal was real, wouldn't that have been a great headline the next day? You know, international news, you know, alien UFO show up over uh, McGuire Air Force Base, uh, alien, an alien shot dead. That would have been fantastic, you know. That would, you know, people are interested. Then we want everyone lo- would love to read these kind of stories on a regular basis. The, the truth, rather than every time something like this happens, it gets shoved under the rug. And everyone's told, you know, all the uh, all the underlings in the military are show, told to keep their lips zipped. Uh, yeah, it would be so much better if, you know, these things would, you know, make the news right when they happen and we just move through life and it's all part of the ongoing history as it unfolds rather than, you know, going, one, going back and wondering if it's real or not. I actually, I, I believe that the that there's more veracity to this case. To the, uh, I believe that it's most likely real. I think that that I I'm leaning toward real on the on the McGuire Air Force Base alien getting shot dead. I think it's uh, most likely real. But that's just my opinion. Doesn't make me right. Anyway, until next time.